What were some of the dumbest ways to flex and just dumb and strange decisions overall that we covered in 2024? Let's get right to it with this marathon of our past videos in 2024. What are some of the dumbest crimes people will actually do? Let's get right to it, starting with... Number 7. No need to scam? Former reality TV star British Williams pleaded guilty to 15 counts of fraud. The Basketball Wives star was indicted for not paying taxes, identity theft, and underreporting her business income. And in that tin was a computer with millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin that Zhang himself had stolen. He promised to cover her college tuition if she moved overseas with him while he played in Russia. The pair has one child together, but their relationship broke down when both sides were unfaithful. Then, Williams developed a serious gambling issue, which she said was the main reason for her crimes. She also said that while she knew what she was doing was wrong, she didn't think it would result in jail time. Williams owed $29,000 in taxes due to underreporting her income from 2017 to 2019 and claimed a niece and nephew as dependents. However, her criminal activity didn't end there. Williams also stole social security numbers to open lines of credit and bank accounts. The identity theft victims lost almost $30,000 since Williams didn't pay into any of the accounts she opened. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she applied for nine economic injury disaster loans. Williams then lied about her business income and payroll in her applications, resulting in a $144,400 payout for the TV personality. She received over 50,000 bucks from Paycheck Protection Program loans designed for small businesses seeking funds to cover payroll costs and benefits for two months. Also, she submitted multiple fake medical bills and received roughly $140,000. And if you thought her criminal activity ended after the indictment, <laughs> you'd be wrong. Williams applied for the California COVID-19 Rent Relief Program, claiming she couldn't pay her rent as her employer reduced her hours due to the pandemic. She reported her household income as $50,000 and lied about being a California resident. So where did the money go? Williams flaunted her lavish lifestyle on basketball wives. Luxury items are expensive, as you know, and she seemed to need them in bulk. However, life was different behind the scenes, and Williams later said her reason for doing the show was to cover her sister's master's degree and save her home from foreclosure. And she already said she had a gambling problem, so it was starting to make it sound like she was just saying anything. But the judge, who didn't really care what nonsense reason Williams threw out there, sentenced her to four years in prison for a whole bunch of fraud and ordered her to pay $564,000 in restitution. Williams and her attorney said that they felt like the court had made an example of her because she's a celebrity, which is possibly true. And oh well, if it is, right? If you're going to be famous, you have to take the good with the bad. She also did a lot of stupid things. Williams filed an appeal to postpone her prison check-in date of December 11th, 2023, so she could spend the holidays with her five-year-old daughter. While the judge granted the request, Williams then failed to report to jail on January 16th, 2024, as she filed a last-minute appeal to reduce her sentence from four to 2.6 years. The stupid thing about all this is that when Williams actually said she didn't think that all of that would result in jail time, she literally stole identities and ran up lines of credit, then straight up lied to take advantage of COVID funds. What did she possibly think was going to happen if she got caught? And she was already decently famous, so she had plenty of avenues to make significant money that simply aren't available to the average person. If the court made an example of her, it's probably because, yeah, she deserved it. Number six, a job and some jail time, please. Fugitive Zaima Johnson revealed her whereabouts to law enforcement when she applied for a job at the New Jersey Sheriff's Office. Just 
why. After stealing two credit cards, the former post office worker was on the run from law enforcement in Monroe County, Pennsylvania. She was also wanted on 10 bench warrants for failure to appear in court on traffic charges. It was initially difficult to track down Johnson until she responded to a job posting for a security guard position in a law enforcement office in New Jersey. During her background check, the sheriff's office realized Johnson had multiple warrants out for her arrest. Johnson thought she was going to the station for a job interview, but officers were waiting to take her into custody when she got there. You would think it would be obvious not to apply for a job with law enforcement when you have multiple warrants out for your arrest, but maybe she wanted to get caught? Maybe the burden of all those traffic violations was just keeping her up at night. Number five, disguised attempt. Nicholas Coffey gave police all the information they needed for an arrest when he flaunted his stolen Mercedes-Benz on social media. As well as bragging on social media about his new ride, Coffey had distinct face and neck tattoos that helped law enforcement confirm he was their suspect. Coffey and his accomplice had used the vehicle to commit a series of car break-ins in Deltona, Florida. A license plate reader picked up on the stolen car driving around on the evening of the break-ins and on the five streets where they happened. Happened. Residential security cameras caught the two young men wearing face coverings and gloves too, like real professionals. Video surveillance footage from a gas station also caught Coffee pulling up in the vehicle shortly after its owner reported it stolen. Coffee had gone inside the gas station wearing the face covering around his neck and blue latex gloves. Police compared images from the gas station footage and used his tattoos to identify Coffee. In some of Coffee's social media posts, he also wore the same clothing as the night at the gas station. There was already a warrant out for his arrest from a separate case, so detectives tracked him down and arrested him. So like, look, get tattoos where you want, but why on earth would you get them on your face and then commit crimes? Hey, you know what would be sick? If we got tattoos on our faces to make us easily identifiable, and we'll look scary and even more memorable. They look awesome on social media. The police don't even know what that is. <sighs> Number four, the sheep pajamas. British armed robber Terry Sullivan learned the hard way that if you're going to commit a crime, you shouldn't do it wearing your girlfriend's jammy jams. Even though this story is from 2013, which was only like two years ago, right? This story is just too good to pass up. Anyways, Sullivan was an accomplice in a series of armed robberies. He was part of a gang of four thieves who communicated with one another through a inconspicuously named Blackberry messenger group called Armed Robbers. Blackberries were what people had before iPhones, kids. Anyway, the group sent each other selfies posing with weapons in the group chat, which is super weird, right? All these armed robbers taking a bunch of silly pictures like they're teenage girls. The group wore balaclavas as they stole cash, cigarettes, scratch cards, and more from seven stores and one residential property. Sullivan and his accomplices demanded that the safes be opened and emptied. Obviously, people were too scared to notice Sullivan's interesting choice of clothing as he wore his girlfriend's cartoon sheep pajamas during at least one raid. They stole $19,000 and 12,000 bucks of stock during their crime spree. The gang members' love for selfies and documenting their hauls made it easy for police to gather information. When officers found photos of Sullivan in the infamous sheep pajamas, they knew they had found their suspects. Although the group was arrested, their charges and sentencing are unknown. Sadly, no one knows what happened to the sheep jammies either. Number three, yeah, I've been making millions, but I just love working here. Janet Yamanaka Mello allegedly swindled the U.S. Army out of $100 million. Yes, $100 million. And it took the government years to figure out this simple scam. Mello founded Child Health and Youth Lifelong Development, known as CHILD, in 2016, and used the company to collect a military partnership grant. The firm's mission was to help Army personnel's children, and it received dozens of grants over the course of six years. However, the organization was just a shell company, and its true purpose was to give Mello access to millions of dollars. She reported that in 2017, Child earned a profit of $483 on revenue of $2,152 used for training consultations. After that, Mello didn't file any subsequent tax returns. Although she worked for the U.S. Army at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, Mello took extra income from the company. She deposited grants 40 times into her fake business and made over a whopping one hundred million dollars in the process. And Mello 
really lived it up with that money too. She owned almost 80 vehicles and 31 properties across multiple states. Her list of mansions included a $3 million property in Canyon Lake, Texas, a $2.3 million estate in Castle Rock, Colorado, a $3.1 million home in Preston, Maryland, a $1.1 million house in San Antonio, Texas, and a $870,000 home in Lakewood, Colorado. And Mello didn't just invest in real estate. She owned multiple Teslas, Harley Davidsons, Aston Martins, Ferraris, Mercedes, Maseratis, and Land Rovers. Her bank records showed she transferred 265,000 bucks from her phony business account to buy a 2023 Landover. What exactly did she tell her friends and family? Oh yeah, I got into Bitcoin back in 2008. There was no way that a government employee earning a $130,000 annual salary, which is a good salary, could afford to live Mello's lifestyle. And soon, she was on the IRS's radar. IRS agents teamed with Army investigators to determine the source of Mello's wealth. They didn't have to look too far, as it was clear that Child was a fake company. A federal grand jury in San Antonio indicted Mello on five counts of fraud and one count of identity theft. If found guilty, she faces over 100 years in prison. You can't just steal that amount of money and then live a lifestyle that isn't even close to what you can afford in your present job without anyone noticing. It's like she posted a huge neon blinking sign with an arrow pointing at her for the IRS. But still, how did it take the government that long to notice $100 million spent was doing nothing? Number two, just need some sleep. A Chinese burglar named Zuo in Shanghai decided one day to sneak into a building so he could steal some stuff. He probably normally gets away with it because most crime just isn't caught. But then it was time for his nap. Crime can be exhausting, especially when it forces you to work late hours. And if he didn't take that nap, we wouldn't be telling you his story. Zuo had big plans when he entered the Shanghai high-rise building at roughly 6.40 p.m. He took the elevator to the eighth floor and found a place to hide while security guards patrolled the area. When the coast was clear, at around 10 p.m., Zuo emerged from his hiding spot and went from office to office, stealing cell phones laptops, and at least one woman's purse. But rather than fleeing the building with his stash of stolen goods, Zuo decided to have a nap instead. Escaping can wait, you know? If you're tired, you're tired. Surveillance cameras caught him putting down his hall and falling asleep in the hallway of all places. He must have been in a deep sleep too, because he was still there when the security guards arrived for their shifts at 6 a.m. The workers discovered Zuo was on the eighth floor and called the police, who arrested him for stealing. This story leaves us with so many questions. Why nap in the middle of a crime? He literally could have slept anywhere but that building and had a better outcome. Was he on something? Is he really that stupid? We don't have the answers. After this video, be sure to stay right here to find out some more of the dumbest crimes people will do. Number one, the dumbest places. When it comes to running from the cops, some fugitives will do whatever it takes to avoid getting caught, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Florida law enforcement spent weeks searching for Stacy Usher, who broke her probation by selling some, uh, let's just call it illegal substances. They eventually tracked down her location, but they didn't find exactly where Usher was hiding inside the house until they checked the couch, noticing something suspicious. Usher stuffed herself inside the sofa and covered her body with the cushions like you did when you were six and you tried to convince your cousin that the couch was alive or maybe that was just us anyway unfortunately usher's attempt at hiding from police officers backfired and the sheriff's office named her the warrant of the week posting her mugshot and charges all over social media hiding inside a couch wasn't an option for joshua hobson who was on the run from the cops after stealing a car and leaving a gas station without paying when officers officers went to his home, they thought the property was empty. That was until one of them realized that a large teddy bear was breathing heavily, which is also creepy, right? Since teddy bears don't usually come to life, usually, the officers inspected the soft toy and discovered Dobson inside. He was arrested and charged with auto theft, driving without a license, and stealing from a gas station. It would have been awesome if he tried to get up and start moving in that thing though, right? We mean, it probably wouldn't have ended well for him since he'd be 
scaring armed police officers, but still. Ivan Lopez didn't have time to get creative with his hiding spot when police officers in Oxnard, California responded to a call from Lopez's house. So he rushed to the laundry room and climbed into the dryer. Officers initially thought their suspect fled the scene, but they figured they should check the laundry room to be sure. They found Lopez and ordered him to get out of the front-loading dryer and arrested him. But he was wrinkle-free and smelled a fabric softener, which officers all agreed was delightful. Who are some of the most despicable criminals around? Let's find out. Starting with... Number six, twice as nice. Fraudster Ashley Singh went to prison for stealing debit and credit cards at the gym to fund his lavish lifestyle. And five years after his release, he was back behind bars for the same crime. Singh and his partner, Sophia Bruya, snuck into the locker rooms of a bunch of gyms and searched people's belongings for their wallets and SIM cards. They maxed out the stolen credit cards on extravagant vacations, designer goods, and even a pedigree puppy. Before Bruya became his partner in crime, Singh had worked with a man named Tony Clark, who helped him steal $290,000 from a bunch of other gym people's bank accounts while they did whatever gym people do at gyms, picking up things or whatever. Singh and Clark took photos of victims' credit cards and replaced their SIM cards with fake ones so they could take control of the bank account. It also meant that when they called the victims' banks, it looked like they were calling from the victims' phones. When they accessed someone's account, they would change PIN numbers, transfer money between accounts, and increase credit card limits. They used the money to buy things like Rolexes, but eventually, they were caught. Officers arrested Clark first, so Singh continued the operation on his own. Police tracked him down in September of 2018 and discovered he had multiple computers, tablets, two Rolexes, and another watch worth $56,000. Singh got tossed in the slammer by way of a six and a half year prison sentence. If he had served his entire sentence, he wouldn't have left prison until 2025. But the terms of his imprisonment meant he was released on parole after serving only half of his sentence. So Singh immediately returned to doing crime the minute he got out. This time, Sophia Bruya was his accomplice. For about a year, the pair stole $315,000 from gym lockers, and they weren't shy about flaunting their wealth either. Singh and Bruya filled their social media pages with photos of themselves driving luxury cars, posing next to designer suitcases, and sharing clips of their expensive pedigree dogs. Law enforcement arrested the pair at London's Gatwick Airport after they returned from a trip to Paris. 18 victims came forward, all having suffered extreme stress due to the couple's thefts. Singh was sent back to prison for three years and Bruya received a 20-month sentence at a young offenders institute suspended for two years. So since Singh clearly didn't learn anything at all the first time around, was three years enough time for the repeat convict or should he have gotten a longer sentence? What do you think? Tell us in the comments below. Number five, blowing the life insurance. Christoph Bezinski stole his late wife's life insurance payout to spend on luxury vacations with his new girlfriend. He's a great guy. Anna Mischuk had sadly passed away two months after receiving a breast cancer diagnosis back in September of 2017. She wanted her $250,000 life insurance money to go to her youngest son when he turned 25, which he would share with Patricia, his sister. Patricia was a trustee of her mother's insurance policies. But a month after Anna passed, Bazinski tricked his stepdaughter into signing the policies over to him. He then helped himself to the cash as if it were his own and even tapped into some of it when his terminally ill wife was still alive. After Anna passed away, Bazinski invited Patricia on multiple extravagant vacations, which he claimed to pay for as his business was flourishing. Although he used some of the life insurance cash to invest in a shop and help his failing business, it only took him nine months to burn through all the money. Patricia started to get the feeling something was wrong when she tried to dip into the money once to cover her rent, and Bazinski unexpectedly 
completely flipped. She finally figured out what he had done, and she saw pictures of him with his new girlfriend at fancy restaurants and enjoying a brand new hot tub. The situation destroyed the family. Patricia knew Bazinski for most of her life and never thought he could do something so cruel. She was just 16 years old when he married her mother, and they lived together as a family in Poland for a while. Bazinski and Anna eventually moved to the UK, and Patricia joined them soon after. Patricia described them as an ordinary family until her mother's health declined. By the time Anna learned she had cancer, the disease had spread throughout her body and was incurable. Patricia wasn't sure of the exact moment when Bazinski got access to the life insurance policy, which her mother took out before she passed away for her children's future. After Anna's passing, there was a lot of paperwork, and it was hard to keep track of everything. Patricia suspected her stepfather may have even hidden the papers from her. When Bazinski told Anna's children they couldn't use the life insurance policy, Anna's son called the financial advisor and learned that someone had wiped out the funds. So Patricia called Bazinski to confront him, but he went quiet and hung up the phone. Friends convinced her to call the police, which she thankfully did, and they arrested the thief. During his trial, the judge pointed out that Bazinski didn't seem to want to accept that the money was his stepchildren's inheritance and not his. He received a four-year prison sentence. Hopefully it sucks. Number four, Pickleball Pickle. It's sad news when you learn that schemes have finally wormed their way into the pickleball community. We never thought it would happen either, but here we are. Rodney Rocket Grubbs, one of pickleball's best known ambassadors, allegedly ran a Ponzi scheme where he scammed his wealthy friends out of millions of dollars. Grubbs launched Pickleball Rocks in 2009. The company sold apparel and equipment for the sport, and as pickleball grew in popularity, pickleball fans developed an interest in investing in his pickleball business. So, he convinced hundreds of people worldwide to invest millions of dollars in his company. It seemed like his business was thriving until January 2024, when the Indiana Secretary of State Securities Division sent him a cease and desist order for running a potentially fraudulent scheme. As a result, he faced $9 million in judgments and four additional lawsuits where several scammed investors called for a federal judge to force the CEO into Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Grubbs told the judge that he couldn't afford to pay investors back, especially if all 250 of the people he scammed came forward. His only eligible assets were some rental properties and Pickleball Rocks equipment and apparel, which were worth less than a million dollars combined. Before people learned the truth about Grubbs' scheme, he was a well-respected member of the pickleball community. He was friendly and engaging, and investors trusted him. His victims included doctors, lawyers, professors, and even a financial consultant. He used his reputation and the reputation of his investors to get people to give him more money. Ron Ponder, an Oklahoma-based pickleball referee, invested $65,000 in Grubbs' business. Grubbs approached Ponder to discuss his new business idea and kept asking for more money, which the referee willingly gave him. Then, Grubbs failed to pay back a loan to Ponder. And a few weeks later, Ponder learned that the alleged entrepreneur had scammed hundreds of people. Grubbs gave all his victims a similar pitch, where he guaranteed a 12% interest rate and a lump sum repayment after 18 months. The deal was so enticing that people handed over their retirement funds and life savings. Investors begged for their money back, but Grubbs didn't respond even when he received letters from lawyers. At this point, he hasn't been criminally charged over the scheme, but we're sure he's going to be, and will probably be rocketed to prison. Are you into pickleball? Or did you just give up trying to play because you have to fight a bunch of seniors to use the courts? Let us know in the comments below. Number three, Miles Pfeffer. Temple University student Miles Pfeffer allegedly took the life of Temple University police officer Christopher Fitzgerald. He responded to an off-campus incident on a Saturday night in February of 2023. Fitzgerald was in an area near campus that had experienced a series of robberies and carjackings when he saw three people wearing masks and dressed in black. Two of the suspected robbers fled, but Fitzgerald managed to catch up to Pfeffer. He chased after the 18-year-old, but after taking multiple rounds, the officer 
officer sadly collapsed. Pfeffer then approached Fitzgerald and dug through the cop's pockets, trying to take his weapon. He then allegedly ran up to a female student who was near her car and forced her to give him her keys. Pfeffer fled the scene in the stolen vehicle. A short time later, his mother picked him up and took him home. Law enforcement tracked Pfeffer down and arrested him in a multi-agency effort at his home in the Philadelphia suburbs. U.S. Marshals took him into custody wearing a pair of Fitzgerald's handcuffs, which is tradition in instances when there's a fallen officer. It wasn't the first time Pfeffer was on law enforcement's radar either, as he was one of three teenagers who threatened to cause harm at his high school. When administrators received the warning messages from the police department, they forced students to shelter in place and dismiss them early. The school never found evidence to back up the warnings, and Pfeffer was arrested several months later. He was charged with making false reports and terroristic threats in February of 2022. A year later, he was in handcuffs for Fitzgerald's passing, facing multiple charges. As of this video, the case is still ongoing, but Fitzgerald's family is pushing for the final punishment, if you know what we mean. Number two, I spoof update. TJ Fletcher, the guy who masterminded the online fraud shop iSpoof, has been sentenced to 13 years in jail. We previously covered Fletcher's story in another video, so we wanted to give a quick update on the case. Fletcher was the founder and administrator of iSpoof. The site sold scammers tools to mask phone calls, so they appeared to come from a trusted organization like a bank to gain access to people's accounts. Scammers spent hundreds of thousands of dollars each month using the service. One of of its most popular features was a piece of technology that let fraudsters pose as fraud department employees to con unsuspecting victims. Essentially, scammers used iSpoof's tools to access people's passwords and PIN codes, then emptied their bank accounts. One of the victims lost $3.8 million, and many of the scammers' targets experienced depression, emotional distress, and financial struggles. The site even created a bizarre and tasteless commercial that included images of happy business people who used iSpoof's innovative methods to manipulate victims. At the end, it said customers could pay using Bitcoin before a cartoon of people cheering as banks rained down upon them. Because who doesn't love a bit of whimsy when ruining people's lives? Fletcher made roughly two and a half million dollars from iSpoof, which paid for his luxury London apartment, two Range Rovers, and a Lamborghini. Authorities took down the spoofing service in the UK's biggest fraud sting. London's Metropolitan Police tracked Fletcher down at his girlfriend's house and arrested him. As iSpoof's founder and lead administrator, Fletcher pleaded guilty to four charges, including supplying an article for fraud. He received a 13-year and four-month prison sentence. Too bad there's no little commercial with a bunch of little prisoners raining down on him, right? If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here for our past release to find out how she pretended to be a doctor. Number one, the hit and run. Miami police arrested singer and influencer Danny Lee for a hit and run and driving under the influence. The accident occurred in May of 2023 when she crashed into a driver on a moped and fled the scene despite the motorist sustaining serious injuries, including a kidney laceration and a spinal fracture. It happened early in the morning and before the accident, people saw her driving recklessly in Miami Beach. After the incident, Danny Lee, who is rapper DaBaby's baby mama, headed to Miami International Airport. Police officers tracked down the singer, whose real name is Danielle Lee Curiel, and arrested her. She took a breathalyzer test, which revealed that her blood alcohol content was twice the legal limit. They booked her on three felony charges, which included driving and injuring someone while under the influence and fleeing the scene of a crash. And this wasn't Danny Lee's first time in handcuffs. In 2021, the baby called the police to make a report on Danny Lee roughing him up. Officers arrived on the scene and made no arrests arrests, but came back the next day when the rapper claimed Danny Lee had done the same thing again. The baby live-streamed his attempts at kicking Danny Lee out of his home on Instagram. Danny Lee retaliated by sharing a video of police officers responding to the baby's call. In the clip, she told viewers that he was trying to kick her and their three-month-old baby out of the house. Danny Lee was released on a $9,500 bond following her May 2023 DUI arrest. Well, they sound like a great family, don't they? What are some of the scariest scams or crimes that can happen to anyone, including us? Let's find out. Starting with number seven, the champagne life. 
Con Kingpin Jonathan Arafiana ran a sophisticated money laundering fraud that stole millions of dollars. Gareth and Marilyn Hamblin were looking for somewhere to invest their money when they saw an online ad for CEX Markets. The company offered potentially high returns, so Gareth traveled to London to meet with a CEX representative in person. The couple had no reason to doubt the organization's legitimacy and invested an initial $7,500. Shortly after, they invested two larger sums with the expectations they would use the return on their investments for Gareth's retirement. CEX regularly contacted them to show how their investment was maturing, so as far as they were concerned, everything was great. Gareth was a ship's chief engineer and spent a significant amount of time at sea. In 2018, while at sea, he attempted to log on to his account but couldn't access it. He soon realized that they were the victims of a scam. So, naturally, he panicked and called his wife, who was six thousand miles away. After years of saving up, his entire retirement fund was drained because of one scammer. Although he wanted to retire at 65, he was forced to work into his 70s. Gareth was humiliated by the ordeal and said that if he had invested in something innocently and lost money, then it wouldn't have been as difficult to live with. While victims like the Hamblin suffered devastating financial losses, Arafiana was living a champagne lifestyle of expensive cars, luxury vacations, and penthouse apartments. He oversaw the operation, which laundered almost $15 million through dozens of fake accounts, some of which they registered in unknowing victims' names. The scam involved a legion of cold callers who coaxed potential investors into handing over their life savings on the promise of large returns. However, victims never saw their money again and only realized that they were scammed when they were unable to access their accounts. The operation targeted at least 350 people across Britain, some of whom had to declare bankruptcy. Arafiana tried to hide himself by using a series of fake names, such as Christian Ocean and John Mayer, but detectives eventually caught him through his cell phone data and airline passenger manifests, which linked him to the fraud. During his trial, the prosecution revealed that he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on luxury apartments, Rolls Royces, gold bullion, mortgages, and more. Although the disgraced fraudster expressed his remorse in court, he was found guilty and handed a two-year suspended prison sentence, which seems pretty light for a guy who literally just stole someone's entire retirement. And the thing that's wild is Gareth, who is one of many, was totally wiped out by just one scammer. The poor guy is old. It's not like he's got a lot of time to build his account back up again. We hope he manages to recover. Number six, gone in seconds. Security camera footage caught on tape the moment that thieves drove through North London in a stolen Range Rover. Two masked thieves approached the Range Rover on a motorcycle. One of them watched while the other jumped off the motorcycle and rushed to the Rover's window. They used a crowbar to pry the front window open. When they were successful, one of the men jumped headfirst inside the car with his feet still dangling in the air outside. Seconds later, they started the black 4x4, turned its headlights on, and raced away from the scene. Security camera footage showing that only a minute passed between the thieves breaking into the car and driving away in it. The UK's Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency reported in May of 2023 that Range Rovers had become extremely common targets for thieves. Data showed that Land Rovers were the most stolen brand of cars, with 924 per 100,000 being stolen between 2022 and 2023. This issue dragged the prices of Range Rovers down and made it difficult for owners to get insurance due to the high theft rate. Many Range Rover owners attempted to sell their cars when insurance got too high. Couple Hannah Platts and Kareem Chester bought a Land Rover Defender for roughly $100,000. They took time to shop around for an insurance policy and eventually settled on a plan that cost roughly $3,000 a year. The pair needed an SUV as they lived in a rural area with country roads that were in poor condition and iced over during the winter. While on vacation in Sweden, a few months after buying the car, they received an email from their insurance company to say they could no longer insure the car. Platts attempted to find a plan that would cover the car, but the cheapest quote she found would have been at least 15,000 bucks a year. She was unwilling to spend more than 10% of the car's value on the policy, so the couple decided to sell the car. However, in order to do so, they had to take a loss of roughly $17,500. According to Auto Trader, the average price of a used Range Rover dropped 9% in the second half of 2023. Part of the problem was a spike in keyless car crime, which became one 
one of the most popular ways for criminals to steal expensive cars. Car brands like Jaguar Land Rover invested millions of dollars to put in measures to prevent keyless entry theft by retrofitting its older models. The Daily Mail also published tips to avoid your keyless cars from being stolen, including keeping the key fob away from your car, investing in extra anti-theft protection, being mindful of where you park your car overnight, and installing a tracking device on your car. Number five, frozen brain. Rachel DeCandia received a call to warn her that she had double paid for her Netflix subscription. Right after that, she lost $35,000. DeCandia opened an email about being double charged for the streaming service, which requested her bank details so it could send her a refund. She replied with the requested information, and a week later, received a call from an anonymous person who claimed to be from National Australia Bank's fraud and security team to inform her that her cards and accounts were compromised. They told her that her entire account had been hacked, and she needed to transfer money out to be safe. The caller also told her that someone copied her cards, so she had to send them off for forensics. The Candia transferred $6,040 into an account she believed the bank set up in response to the incident. That same day, an Uber showed up at her house and demanded that she hand over her compromised debit cards. Like many other victims of scams, her brain shut off and she panicked, willing to do anything the scammer said so that the ordeal would be over. So the Candia handed over the cards and the driver sped away. The scammers went on on an elaborate shopping spree with her cards and spent almost $29,000. She also lost the $6,040 that she thought she had transferred to a secure account with the bank. The Candia didn't realize her mistake until she told her partner who immediately reported the incident to her banks and the police. Police officers told the Candia that the thieves bought things like Apple gift cards, iPhones, and took out cash from ATMs, which they likely did so they could convert the illegally obtained goods into hard to trace crypto. Law enforcement Enforcement tracked down one of the scammers, and the National Australia Bank recovered $5,000 of the stolen cash. A pretty far cry from the amount taken, but at least it's something. The Candia was saving up for a down payment on a house and had already applied for a home loan before the scam. However, after losing most of her savings, her dream of owning a home was on hold. Sometimes in stressful situations, our brains just become frozen, and we follow all instructions, something that most likely happened to this poor lady. Number four, stealing homes. Brooklyn-based Christopher Williams stole an elderly widow's home using fake documents. Williams used fake birth and death certificates to convince the New York City Department of Finance that he was Barbara Matthews' son. Once he had the house's deed, he sold the Jamaica Queen's property for $270,000 and pocketed $209,000 in profit from the sale. Matthews had no idea what Williams had done until after the sale. Law enforcement was contacted and police officers arrested Williams. In court, Williams pleaded guilty to first-degree identity theft and offering a false statement for filing. Queen's District Attorney Melinda Katz said that her team would use every tool available to them to ensure that the same scam didn't happen again and to help Matthews recoup her losses. Queen's Supreme Court Justice Judge Lee Chang granted a motion by the DA's office to apply a state law that restores the stolen property to its rightful owner, which spared Matthews from a long and expensive legal process. Williams was found guilty and sentenced to two to four years in prison. Remember the days when it was like you really only had to worry about things like your car getting stolen? As if that wasn't a big enough deal, now you have to worry about someone stealing your house? Strange times indeed. Number three, ING bank account hacked and it's the bank's fault. Scammers impersonated Australian care worker Marilyn Desvaux and stole $40,000 of her life savings. Desvaux was preparing for retirement when scammers gained access to her ING bank account in October of 2023. The impersonators accessed her payee contact list and changed her friend Graham's bank details, linking them to a different account. Over a period of five days, the scammers made 16 transfers under Graham's name and drained Desvo's accounts of tens of thousands of dollars. She realized something was very wrong with her account when she checked her home loan account after the Reserve Bank of Australia increased the cash rate in November 2023. Desvo discovered the abnormal transactions and contacted Graham to see if he received the money shown in the transaction report. Of course, Graham didn't know what she was talking about and when he checked the account details, saw that the information under his name was wrong. So she contacted her bank, ING, who locked her accounts but said they couldn't recover the stolen funds. The care worker had been saving up the money to help her retirement after she lost her job during the COVID-19 pandemic. The situation took an extreme mental toll on Desvo, who reported the incident 
to the police and the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. She tried every avenue she could think of to get her money back and lost almost 10 pounds in a few weeks. An ING spokesperson released a statement saying the bank investigates every reported scam. And while it couldn't comment on Desvo's individual case, ING attempts to recover stolen money whenever possible. The bank didn't take responsibility for Desvo's case, even though it happened due to scammers hacking the bank system. It's always so frustrating to hear these kinds of stories, especially when this poor lady didn't even do anything wrong to get scammed. Something that's definitely scary terrifying. It would be insane if the bank decided not to take responsibility, especially since it was their fault. Number two, fake QR codes. An unnamed London man discovered a QR code scam targeting electric car owners in the UK. In a viral video, the man filmed a sign for a Siemens Ubitricity EV charging port. The sign asked people to scan the QR code and follow its instructions to pay to charge their car. However, the man realized that the QR code had been stuck over the legitimate code and peeled away the sticker. He warned anyone using public EV charging ports to watch out for this latest con. He told viewers that the QR codes should be barcodes and that people needed to rub their fingers over them to feel if the sign was legitimate or a sticker. The man also noted that the fake QR codes were black and the legitimate ones were green. The fake QR code would lead victims to a fake site to extract their details and despite being scammed would still be liable for the electric charge. As EVs grew in popularity, so did ways to scam their owners. Since many people relied on public charging points in places like grocery stores or fast food restaurant parking lots, it was easy for scammers to con drivers into unknowingly handing over their personal information. Britain's action fraud warned consumers against scanning QR codes when possible, and if it was necessary to use one, that they should check the destination site of the QR code. Some details to check for included mistakes or typos, low quality photos, and insecure URLs. If you don't live in Britain, you might think you're safe from this type of thing, but this could definitely happen anywhere in the world. And for the US, if it's not happening already, it will. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out how this girl stole super expensive bottles of wine worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, but she had one big problem. Number one, the wrong account. Georgina Smith went to pick up her new Mercedes-Benz AMG A35 from a Melbourne car dealership when she learned she was the victim of a payment redirection scam. Smith was on her way to get her new car when the dealership called to say it didn't receive her $38,500 deposit, despite Smith already sending the money over. She checked her emails and discovered she received two invoices for the deposit. The invoices were identical at first glance and had the same bank name, Mercedes-Benz Australia Pacific Pty Limited listed on the paperwork. However, on closer inspection, Smith realized that the 14-digit account numbers were different. Smith was the victim of a payment redirection scam, where scammers intercepted her invoice and changed the bank details before sending it to her. Smith bought a car with the same dealership a year before and had no reason not to trust it, especially when the invoice appeared the same as the one she received for her last car. When Smith confronted Mercedes about the scam, the company said the invoice wasn't intercepted on their end and that someone must have hacked her email. The real estate agent purchased the car through her company, Wilson Partners. Because of her job, she handled large transactions daily and knew that if hackers compromised her inbox, they would have targeted other invoices than just the one from Mercedes. To be safe, she hired an independent IT team to check that her servers weren't breached in a hack, found nothing. Smith reached out to her bank, insurance company, and Mercedes-Benz. Nobody could help her get her money back. Eventually, she paid an additional $91,000 to purchase the car, but said she would never purchase another car from Mercedes-Benz again. A Mercedes spokesperson stated that invoice fraud wasn't unique to its industry and highlighted that there was always a risk when there was an exchange of financial information online. Payment redirection scams cost Australians millions of dollars in 2023, and as a successful business person, Smith proved it could happen to anyone, even us. With so many scammers profile rating these days, maybe it makes more sense to do things in person. What are a few of the dumbest crimes people will do? Let's find out. Starting with number six, the stolen Bentley. Thomas Davies stole a vehicle and then posted a picture from inside the stolen car like the internet genius he is. According to the police, Davies is part of a criminal gang of carjackers who are responsible for 35 burglaries and lots of other minor thefts. 
And they didn't just steal vehicles either. They also stole jewelry and cash. They basically took anything they could get their dirty hands on. Instead of stealing and laying low like a person with half a brain, Davies decided to do the very smart and totally not dumb thing by taking a picture in a stolen Bentley and posting it on his Facebook page. The police must have been overjoyed when they saw that picture because it allowed them to build a strong case against Thomas and his gang. In the end, Thomas was sentenced to three years and 10 months in prison. Number five, free upgrades. Rajan Mabubani thought he was Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can when he started dressing like a pilot to bypass security and get seat upgrades. And the funny thing is that despite this scam being quite popular because of Leonardo DiCaprio's movie, it actually worked for a while. Rajan would use a fake ID as well and was used to enjoying pilot perks. The fake pilot here apparently doesn't just love getting special pilot perks either. He also really loves aviation. He loves dressing up in uniforms. He's filmed and posted many videos on aviation on his YouTube and TikTok channels. After pulling the trick a few times and posting it online, he ended up on the authorities' radar and he was eventually apprehended. The funny thing about Rajon is that he didn't switch up his game at all. He just wore a pilot's uniform and used a fake ID, despite the fact that just a three minute background check would out him as a fraud. While he was in custody, Rajon said that he only loved dressing up in uniforms and wasn't up to anything nefarious. But enjoying pilot perks with a fake ID is nefarious enough, isn't it? The authorities also recovered pictures of Rajan dressed up in an army uniform from his phone, so that was probably just going to be a matter of time. Number four, blame everyone else. Lisa Marie Jones stole 250,000 pounds from a dental practice she managed, and when she was caught, she made up ridiculous lies saying that her co-workers were to blame instead. Jones used the money she stole to purchase a bunch of luxury goods, including fancy bags and shoes because Lisa Marie Jones is fancy and lived far beyond what her salary for a 16-hour work week could afford her. How did she ever believe she would get away with this? To carry out her fraud, Jones Jones made sure she paid herself around 8,000 pounds per month, which was about six times her normal 1,200 pounds wage. She was able to carry out the fraud for a pretty long time since she was trusted with the payroll accounting of the practice for at least three decades. In 2000, the dental practice was passed on to a new owner named John Howarth. Howarth made the mistake of retaining Jones because he thought she was an honest employee, totally unaware that Jones was stealing from him. She was doctoring checks made out to her and withdrawing more than she was paid from company accounts. Of course, that made the practice lose money and Howarth almost lost his very mind trying to keep that place afloat. He even worked 52 hours a week until he decided enough was enough. And in 2014, he passed the practice on to another dentist named Chris Fair. Fair wanted to keep things stable by transitioning to digital banking, but Jones made sure that wasn't successful either since she started altering payroll records to get paid more money. Fair eventually found out about the missing money and hired an ex external investigator to help keep track of his finances. That was when he realized just how much Jones had stolen from the company. So Jones's fraud was found out and she was promptly dismissed, but she wasn't about to go away silently. Jones began making very deranged claims and said that her withdrawals were legal because she had an affair with Howarth and he was paying her for silence. Of course, all of that was false and she later confessed to her crimes and she was dragged to court. Jones was sentenced to six years and nine months in jail. Of course, trying to blame someone that wasn't even with the company anymore for your stealing is stupid. Like the police were going to be like, oh, okay, we didn't know it was hush money and everyone else's fault. Sorry, we'll uh, let you go. Number three, driving off. Chelsea Beckham thought she was one clever cookie when she stole the vehicle of someone who offered to drive her around town. And she was clever. But when she was eventually busted because she failed to get rid of the car, she was considerably less clever. It wouldn't be Chelsea's first time defrauding people either. One day, she put up an Xbox 360 online for sale and pretended that it was an X1. She ended up selling the Xbox 360 and defrauded the buyer of 100 pounds. So you could say this type of work is right up her scamming alley. The victim 
him in this weird carjacking case was a man who was driving around the city in his friend's Skoda, which is uh, basically like a Kia. The guy met Chelsea and her partner, who asked him to take her and her partner around town. So the driver was like, sure, and drove them around for a while. Then he stopped to get gas at a gas station. So he went inside and left his keys in the ignition. You can see where this is going. Of course, Chelsea saw the chance of a century and decided to get behind the wheel and steal the car. For some reason, she thought that would be the end and she would just get a great car to drive around it. But that wasn't the end. And she was promptly arrested just two days after the theft. Apparently, there were video cameras all over the gas station. What a shocker. And she was clearly seen hopping into the driver's seat and leaving. Chelsea was then charged and sentenced to 30 weeks in jail. However, since she had spent most of that sentence while remanded, she was shortly released from jail. That means Chelsea still roams the streets to this day, looking for who to scam. Spooky. And really, for you in the comments, whose fault is it really that the car got stolen? The lady who actually stole it or the guy who just left it with the keys in the ignition with a couple of strangers. We're not saying it's okay, but we really don't feel bad for this guy either. It's like the car was just full of dumb people. Number two, just playing. Drew Marshall played a very sick game when he decided to scam unsuspecting shoppers by claiming to own a walking stick that used to belong to Queen Elizabeth. And he did this about a week after the late queen passed away. In the eBay listing for the stick, which looks an awful lot like a cane, Drew claimed that he worked at Windsor Castle and that he had the authority to wield and sell the stick. But that wasn't the only thing he said to sell his scam. He also said that the queen used the stick in her last days as she struggled with mobility and proceeds from the sale would go to Cancer Research UK. What unsuspecting shoppers didn't know was that the proceeds of the sale would only end up in Drew's pockets. By the time Drew decided that he had had enough, bids for the very ordinary walking stick had reached 540 pounds. The only reason he even closed the listing was because he found out that the police were already investigating him and he might not be able to get away with it. When he was eventually arrested, Drew claimed that he didn't try to scam anyone and that his post was merely a so social experiment to see how much people would bid for the stick. Then he said that his computer had actually been hacked by a friend from Spain. But his excuses didn't fly as the police used his computer to prove that Drew had searched the item Queen and how to delete an eBay listing before the listing went down. Remember guys, if you're going to commit a crime, the worst thing to do is Google it. Anyway, our enterprising scammer was found guilty by the courts and has now been forced to pay over 600 pounds in victim surcharges and was also sentenced to a 12-month community order. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out how this guy decided to just blow his investors' money. Number one, nursing injuries. Nicola Bartlett, a once respected nurse in the UK, is respected no more as she's been behind bars for staging an accident. She faked her injuries and collected over 750,000 pounds in insurance claims in a massive insurance fraud scam. Nicola used to have a great career as an NHS nurse in the accident and emergency department, known as the A&E, but then she got involved in one of the largest organized car insurance frauds, which cost her her job and her license. The scam it itself was straightforward. The criminals would get into an accident and then take the cars to a sketchy garage that would declare the vehicles a write-off. Once the vehicles are declared a write-off, the criminal would file an insurance claim and then get money from the insurance company. It was a sweet gig and the garage involved earned a lot from it. But then they began to earn too much and the government started snooping around. Governments can be pesky like that. It was about that time that Nicola decided to also get in on the action and see if she could game the system and get away with it as well. Unfortunately for her, she fell right into the government's lap. Nicola claimed that another vehicle had plowed into her and given her and her brother injuries. She also claimed that the vehicle had been written off after a very special visit to the garage in question. But as we know, that was a lie. However, she got a 16,764 pound payout for her efforts and believed she had successfully committed fraud. Little did she know that things were about to get bad for her. By the time the police were done with the probe 
of the garage, they discovered that the gang of criminals had helped 81 people commit insurance fraud through 21 different crashes. In many cases, the crashes were carried out by the garage gang themselves by driving the involved cars deliberately into forklifts. The only problem was that the gang didn't turn off their cameras. So when the police eventually arrested the gang, all the evidence they needed was right there, recorded by the CCTV. It was game over for Nicola and the crew that helped her defraud her insurance company. She was also dismissed from her job at the NHS, and her nursing license was suspended. In the end, she was charged with conspiracy to defraud and found guilty in court. She was then sentenced to nine months imprisonment, suspended for two years in order to complete 250 hours of community service. She was also asked to pay 1,350 pounds as restitution. What a sad ending for a respected NHS worker who threw away her entire respected career for a few thousand pounds. So here's a tip to leave with you. If you're committing crimes, don't let your CCTV capture evidence of those crimes. Or better yet, don't commit crimes on camera. Or even better, how about just don't commit crimes? What are some of the really bad decisions people will make? Let's find out, starting with number five, even in Hong Kong. Three armed robbers stormed influencer Mei Yan's Hong Kong home and stole $480,000 after she flaunted her wealth online. Because, as we all know, you're not really wealthy unless you're bragging about it online, right? A late night commotion in the living room woke Mei Yan up when she left her bedroom to see what that commotion was, because an unexpected commotion never ends up just being Santa, she discovered that three men had broken into her apartment. At the time, her son and her helper, which is basically a nanny who also does things around the house, were also in the living room. This wasn't looking like a good situation, considering two of the men were armed with a pipe and a small knife. Mei Yen watched as one of the strangers forcefully rubbed the baby's head, which was probably scary scary as hell, prompting her to quickly agree to giving them whatever they wanted. The intruders then forced Mei Yen and her six-month-old son and his nanny into the nursery while they ransacked the house. They tied Mei Yen and the nanny up with tape to stop them from running away, and one of the intruders stood guard outside the room. However, the robbers struggled to find any cash, frustrating and irritating them. So one of them started using some, yeah, let's just call it, very coercive tactics to get Mei Yen to tell them where she kept all her money. She offered her luxury luxury items instead of physical money, as the designer goods were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mei Yan actually wriggled out of her restraints when the thieves left and called law enforcement. Police searched the area, but couldn't find the suspects. Officers discovered that the men left with 10 purses, 7 watches, 2 cell phones, and a laptop, with their haul worth roughly $461,000. And the whole ordeal was caught on security cameras. The suspects had entered the premises wearing caps and surgical masks, and used a door badge from an empty apartment in the building get inside. The robbers had attempted to enter Mei Yan's apartment the day before when they showed up dressed as delivery men. She was asleep at the time and didn't answer the building's security guard to grant them entry. Mei Yan slammed her building's management company since she had told them not to let anyone inside without her permission. The social media star had almost 100,000 followers on Instagram and constantly delivered content that showed off her wealth. She shared pictures of her collection of designer handbags, expensive jewelry, luxury hotels, stays and in front of fancy sports cars. After the robbery, she posted an appeal to her followers to bring the culprits to justice and offered a $200,000 reward for information. Although she didn't know the culprits, they clearly targeted her. Home invasions like that don't just happen in Asia without a specific reason. Hong Kong has the second highest concentration of millionaires in Asia, so there were plenty of other wealthy people to target. So why did the robbers choose Mei Yan as their target? We might not know for sure, but a general rule of thumb is that there's no upside to showing your wealth online. Unless you're a scammy business guru promoting online courses. Number 4. BitBoy Fights Back Crypto influencer Ben Armstrong live-streamed himself storming his former business partner's home to confront him about his alleged wrongdoing. Armstrong, who goes by the intimidating name BitBoy, captured himself arriving at Carlos Diaz's driveway. In the 40-minute live stream, Armstrong took the time to explain to his followers what was happening. He said Diaz was planning to snuff him out and had ties to the mafia in Houston. According to Armstrong, Diaz stole his Lamborghini, but Diaz told a different story. About a month before the incident, 
Bitcoin, Armstrong's former company, BitBoy Crypto, ousted him and took his car to repay funds that he allegedly took from the company. The whole ordeal had gotten Armstrong to get extremely fired up, but after repeatedly saying that he wasn't scared of Diaz, which means he probably was, his former business partner snapped and called the police. Officers arrived on the scene where Armstrong admitted to possessing a weapon and was arrested and charged with intimidation. You have to wonder if, when Diaz found out what Armstrong was charged with, he was like, whatever, I wasn't even scared though. Why'd they say I was scared? No, I wasn't scared, but he didn't convince anyone. Anyway, Armstrong's mistress, who was waiting in a car nearby, because of course it's a mistress, she was charged with loitering and prowling. The cops took Armstrong back to the station, where he spent eight hours in jail before posting his $2,600 bond. Hey, bit boy, there's probably a better way to confront a former business partner that doesn't involve you getting yourself arrested on a live stream. Number three, handpicked. Denver pastor of the online-only Victorious Grace Church, Eli Regalado, sold $3.4 million of God-backed, worthless crypto. So much of that is already problematic, right? Regalado and his wife Caitlin set up the Kingdom of Wealth Exchange and told their investors that their index coins were God-backed. The individual coins cost $1.50, but the Regalados told them that they were worth $10 each. Investors thought the coins were much more stable than other types of crypto, as the coins allegedly had an unparalleled risk-to-return ratio, making them an enticing opportunity for new and seasoned crypto enthusiasts. Regalado had said that God told him to bring crypto to his church, because God often has good ideas about finances. Before the pastor found God, he served time for several carjackings, but Regalado decided when he left prison, change his life and find a deeper sense of purpose. And that purpose meant bringing crypto to church? Regalado had told investors many lies like telling them that there were 30 million index coins in circulation, which would have meant that the company had made $300 million from the coins. Unsurprisingly, investors found out that there was only $30,000 in the company's bank account. The couple pocketed 1.3 million bucks, which funded their Range Rover, home renovations, luxury purses, and more. And it wasn't their first business venture together either. The Regalados had previously run Grace-led marketing, a marketing organization led by Grace apparently. And to their credit, the pair were skilled marketers who knew how to appeal to the masses. They told investors that the profits they made would go towards helping widows and orphans, but they only helped themselves to the cash instead. Anyway, the Kingdom of Wealth Exchange had boasted that the cybersecurity firm Hacken had audited the company. However, it failed to mention that Hacken gave the organization a 0 out of 10. Eventually, the SEC shut down the crypto operation, making it impossible for investors to get their money back. The SEC that then froze Regalado's assets and the pair were sued for fraud and a judge banned the couple from selling securities. Since their charges were civil and not criminal, they only faced fines rather than time in prison. Then Regalado posted a nine minute video where he told users that the charges against him and Caitlin were true. Regalado confessed that they took $1.3 million from Index Coins Investments. He claimed they ran out of money, but that God would work a miracle in the financial sector. The couple said that they took God's word at face value, like you do, and sold massive amounts of crypto without a clear exit strategy. Regalado also pleaded with investors not to get angry with the SEC lawyers and be patient with them during the investigation. We can only imagine that the Regalados' lawyers face palming the entire time they watched the viral video. Number two, sugar gone bad. Haley McNally abandoned her sugar daddy at a U2 concert so she could steal $50,000 from his hotel safe. McNally met an unnamed man who was in his 50s on Seeking Arrangements, a website that connects sugar daddies and babies. The two had met five weeks before the incident and he soon became her sugar daddy. They arranged to spend the weekend at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas in exchange for $2,500. The man gave her the cash at the beginning of the trip, after which they spent the rest of the day at the pool before going out to dinner. McNally hung out with him and his friends the next day, then they headed to a casino, and after winning money gambling, she asked if she could put it in the man's hotel safe. So the man gave her the code, and when opened the safe, 
she saw $50,000 in cash that he kept there, as well as $7,000 in casino chips. You can probably see where this is headed. Later that night, the couple left the hotel and went to a U2 concert. While the victim was distracted by the music, McNally excused herself to use the bathroom. Fifteen minutes later, the man texted McNally to see where she was, but she didn't respond. After an hour, he called the hotel and asked them to put his room on lockdown. But it was too late. When he got back, he discovered she had emptied the safe and vamoosed. Surveillance footage caught McNally entering the hotel room around 30 minutes after saying she needed the bathroom. A few minutes later, she walked toward the elevator carrying multiple bags. Officers quickly tracked down McNally and arrested her. She said that during the concert, the victim was aggressive and touching her inappropriately, so she decided to leave. McNally also said that she went into the safe to get her stuff. However, police recovered $5,200 in casino chips and $11,700 in cash when they searched her apartment. She was charged with grand larceny and residential burglary. It's hard to tell who was the dumber person in this story. The guy for giving her the code to the safe or McNally for taking the evidence home. Tell us what you think in the comments below. And if you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here to find out how police found this guy because of his dumb posts on social media. Number one, a million every week. Linda Andrade showed off her lavish lifestyle on social media, but broadcasting her massive expenses and displays of wealth raised suspicions for people on the web. Andrade's husband, Ricky Andrade, became a millionaire when he was 22 and founded eight companies, including a tech company, a charity, and a nonprofit. The man who once worked as a commercial dishwasher technician claimed his success began when he ventured into affiliate marketing. In a July 2023 edition of Seeker's Time, Ricky talked how he had recently made $100 hundred thousand dollars in one day and while ricky discussed some of the details of his finances his wife linda was busy spending everything he made the couple had met when linda joined the gym where ricky worked since then their income supposedly increased dramatically ricky claimed to have multiple revenue sources including investments in real estate stocks and crypto and linda assumed the role of stay-at-home wife while ricky handled their finances and by handling finances we mean spending finances linda posted about a week in her life on TikTok where she bragged about the cash at her disposal. According to her video, Ricky had given her $1.4 million to spend that week. So she headed to numerous luxury stores where she spent $356,000 on things like Chanel purses. She also headed to a chocolate store and spent $7,200 on candy, which is like, hey, we like chocolate too, but not $7,000 worth. Then on the Wednesday of that week, she burned through $217,000, but didn't say on what. Many followers thought her stories were fake, especially since their income didn't match Linda's spending. If she had a weekly allowance of $1 million, Ricky would have to be a billionaire which he said he wasn't. Also, if you follow this channel, you know that claiming you make your money from crypto and Forex probably means you're someone who's a fraud. So that's another strike. And even if they did have that kind of income, bragging about it online would make them easy targets for robberies. Usually when people are that wealthy, they don't need to flaunt it to feel good about themselves. You don't hear about Cuban running around bragging about his money. Look, at the end of the day, we don't know too much about these people's lives how much they're worth, how they make their money, or what they spend it on. But we're pretty sure, and we think you're probably sure as well, that there's some phony baloney going on here. Ultimately, the moral of the story here is, don't brag about being wealthy online. There's nothing in it for you, and it never works out the way you hope. And besides, no one likes a bragger. What are a few of the most questionable decisions people will make? For example, did this firefighter make the right or wrong decision getting her neck tattoo? Or what about this guy who decided to pretend to be a cop? Or how about this guy who was caught by police after he bragged online about his cash? Let's find out. Starting with number seven, the neck tattoo. Ex-firefighter Kayana Adams lost her job with the Mobile Fire Department over a tattoo on the back of her head. So what was the big deal about the tattoo? Let's find out. Adams worked at the fire department for nine months before her employer fired her for the new ink. Despite the department's policy against facial or neck tattoos, Adams got a head tattoo anyway. She assumed that since the department had already hired people with prominent neck tattoos after she got the job, then getting one on 
on her head shouldn't be an issue. Also, she knew she could cover it up, so no biggie, right? However, one of her co-workers thought it was a biggie and submitted a complaint about the tattoo, so the department ended up investigating her. She had to sit through an interrogation over the matter, and the fire department concluded that her ink violated their tattoo policy. The city, being reasonable at the time, offered to let it go if she just grew her hair out to hide the tattoo, which she did. But somehow, everyone forgot that growing out hair takes time, and a few weeks later, someone else submitted a complaint. Adams explained that as an African-American woman, she had different textured hair and had no idea how long it would take to grow in enough to cover the tattoo. Then, three months after she got the tattoo, the department updated its policy to prohibit head tattoos completely. A captain at her station took a picture of the back of Adams' head, which showed the tattoo was no longer visible. However, she still lost her job that day, and two captains who defended her were disciplined, with one of them getting fired, both of whom are appealing the decision. Adams has since filed a federal discrimination lawsuit against the city of Mobile, alleging that her termination wasn't solely about the tattoo, but was a pretext for discrimination based on her race, gender, religion, and orientation. The lawsuit claims that she faced a hostile work environment and was subjected to harassment, including racist remarks from colleagues. As of the release of this video, the case is ongoing, and Adams is seeking redress for what she claims was unjust treatment during her tenure at the Mobile Fire Rescue Department. So what do you think? Who is making the worst decisions here? The person who is still on probation in a new job that decided to get a tattoo that violates policy because other people did it, or the people who are making a huge deal about her violating policy even though she was doing everything the department asked her to do to rectify the situation? Let us know in the comment section. Number six, Play Cop. Antoine Tuxin spent 15 years pretending to be a police officer, but his scheme finally fell apart when he called the actual police department for backup. Tuxin pretended to be a U.S. Marshal and had the props to prove it. He had a bite dog, a police vest, a taser, and even a firearm. However, he couldn't keep up the ruse forever. In March of 2022, he tried to arrest a couple women at a restaurant who were attempting to dispute their bill. Of course, the situation escalated since that's not something you'd typically get arrested for, so Tuxin Tuxin made the questionable decision to call Prince George's County Police Department. Tuxin met the officers at the restaurant and flashed them his badge before explaining what went down. But while they were outside talking, something else caught the officers' attention. Amidst all the chaos, Tuxin left his dog inside the restaurant, something law enforcement canine handlers never do. Law enforcement demanded to see Tuxin's credentials again, so in order to combat this, he called his friend, who goes by the name Ninja Rich, to pretend to be his supervisor. So, Ninja Rich who wasn't even a real ninja, arrived on the scene in police-style clothing while officers were arresting Tuxin. He wore a fake uniform and carried a firearm, a radio, handcuffs, and expandable baton. Ninja Rich explained that the dog was an emotional support animal as well as a patrol dog to try and explain away the situation. But that's not something that would ever happen since police dogs go through very different training than support dogs. So even with Ninja Rich's brilliant disguise and excuses, he couldn't stop officers from taking Tuxin and into custody. Law enforcement placed the dog in the care of Prince George's County Animal Services Division. The next day, Ninja Rich turned up at the Animal Services Center, claiming to be a U.S. Marshal, and the center gave him the dog back. This wasn't Tuxin's first stint behind bars. The police imposter was accused of the same offense three times before. Back in 2018, he involved himself in a robbery by claiming to be a U.S. Marshal to the victim and responding officers. He was also arrested multiple times between 2005 and 2009 for receiving stolen property. Over the years, he was also convicted for carrying a firearm without a license and for first-degree theft. Upon his arrest, federal officers discovered he had equipped his car with police-style blue and red flashing lights and also carried a fake ID card. Tuxin was ultimately sentenced in July of 2023 to 37 months in federal prison. Seriously, did Texan really think he was going to fool actual cops? Like, it seems incredibly obvious that an actual police officer would never just leave a trained police dog anywhere. And then even trying to get your buddy to help you and double down on the authenticity was 
really stupid. Number five, the convenient excuse. Businessman Lester Hui refused to pay back hundreds of thousands of dollars to a London casino as he claimed he was too drunk to gamble. According to Hui, he had to drink a shot of fire water, Mao Tai liquor, after losing a drinking game. The alcohol was 65% proof, and by the early hours of the morning, he had at least four shots of it, although some reports claim it was closer to 10. In Hui's version of events, Chris DeLima, the casino's vice president of international marketing, provided the dice and ordered a bottle of Mao Tai to the table before playing the drinking game. However, DeLima dismissed Hui's claims and argued that Hui was sober enough to make his own decisions, saying that Hui even drove himself home at the end of the night. But Hui refused to back down, claiming that he was so intoxicated they shouldn't have allowed him to gamble. The casino, Aspinall's Club, whose clients included royalty and celebrities and was only open to exclusive members, of course denied the allegations and demanded Hui pay back his 775 $5,000 in losses. Hui allegedly drank three and a half bottles of wine or champagne that evening, as well as the shots. He signed five pledges for gambling credits throughout this time at the casino. Ultimately, Hui lost $775,000 and handed the casino a blank check for the payout, but it bounced a week later, prompting Aspinall's club to sue him. Both sides refused to back down in court, with Hui doubling down on his accusations of the casino, letting him get too drunk to make informed decisions and the casino denying his claims. So the question here is, was this a dumb strategy or a smart strategy? On one hand, being clearly intoxicated makes it easy for Hui to claim he wasn't able to make any rational decisions and therefore shouldn't have been allowed to gamble. On the other hand, the casino is likely well prepared for people claiming that they were way too drunk to gamble to get out of paying debts, and there would be plenty of video evidence to show exactly how intoxicated he was. Ultimately, the court ruled against Hui, finding that his claim of being too intoxicated to be responsible for his gambling decisions was unconvincing, which is pretty much what we would have guessed. Number four, the conniving clerk. A security camera captured a gas station clerk, Meet Patel, stealing a million dollar lottery ticket from an unsuspecting customer. The unnamed customer, who was apparently very lucky, bought two scratch-off tickets that day, one worth $40 and the other worth $1 million. After scratching off the barcode, the customer asked Patel to check and see if the tickets were winners. Store video showed Patel lying that the $1 million had nothing on it. He then took the ticket and placed it in the trash until the customer left the store. Then he took it and put it in his pocket, real smooth-like. The store footage then showed him celebrating winning the million dollars. However, for earnings higher than $200,000, winners had to collect their winnings at the Tennessee Lottery's Nashville headquarters. So when Patel tried to claim the prize, employees were suspicious and refused to give him the ticket. Upon further investigation, they discovered that he had stolen it from the rightful winner. So the organization tracked down the unknowing customer to tell him he had won $1 million. Patel was arrested for theft and held on a $100,000 bond. Number three, credible threats. Detroit resident Ariel Moore sent threats to multiple beauty school classmates where she threatened to blast her school. Apparently, she was expelled earlier that day for bad behavior, whatever that means, and didn't take it well. So she thought she'd show everyone what real bad behavior was and sent out some pretty serious threats. Moore sent texts to classmates, including one of an actual firearm she said she was going to use, and made multiple calls to the David Presley School of Cosmetology to make even more threats. So of course, that scared the hell out of everyone and staff canceled classes for the next few days. Fortunately, Moore didn't actually act on anything. The thing was, Moore already had an arrest warrant for felony identity theft when she was arrested for her new threats. She faced 20 years in prison and fines of up to $20,000. Despite her past legal problems, and she seems to have had many, with a couple of cases moving through the courts, Moore's social media posts suggest that she's turned a new leaf. We don't know what ended up happening with the school threats case, but she seems to have moved to Indonesia, where she seems to be committed to being a better person. Hopefully, she figures out some of her issues, and maybe getting expelled and leaving Detroit might have been the best thing for her. Number two, the biased, unbiased judge. 
Central New York Supreme Court Justice Aaron P. Gall made some racially insensitive comments to police and civilians after an incident at a 2022 party and it cost her her job. You'd expect to hear this stupid stuff coming from drunk actors or something, but not from a New York Supreme Court Justice, right? Gall was a guest at a high school graduation party where groups of uninvited teens suddenly turned up. Fights broke out and her husband and son were involved in them. The police were called to break it up and Gall spoke to the police officers when they arrived on the scene. During the 80-minute interaction, the judge said a group of four black teens didn't look smart and that they were definitely not going to business school. Unfortunately for Gall, the cop's body cam caught her entire rant. The New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct ruled that she demonstrated racial bias. Gall disagreed and argued that, despite her comments, she should stay at her post because she didn't actually have a racial bias. But she also repeatedly invoked her position as a judge when she was talking to the police and said she would always side with them, which shows more bias, right? She was apparently trying to get the police to arrest whomever she felt needed to be arrested and tried to use her position to influence their decisions. However, the commission made her watch back the body cam footage and she desperately hung on to any details that would get her out of trouble. She said she never referred specifically to the black males and testified that she wasn't racist and didn't see color. She also acknowledged that she shouldn't have brought up her status as a judge, but added that everyone there already knew who she was anyway. Which also doesn't make sense because if everyone knew who she was, then why would she need to keep talking about it? Really, why bring it up at all? Despite her unsuccessful attempts to walk back her comments, the commission suspended her without pay. It seems like Justice Gall should have just kept her mouth shut and let the police do their job, doesn't it? It's common knowledge that pretty much all cops have body cameras these days for the protection of everyone, so for her to start blabbing about her opinions, racial or not, was quite dumb. And as a judge, you'd think that she'd never want to show any kind of bias anyway. What are some of the dumbest and strangest crimes people will commit? Let's find out. Starting with number six, money in the air. A Nigerian socialite who goes by the name Cubana Chief Priest has been charged with abusing Nigerian banknotes. Apparently, Mr. Cubana was caught on video throwing money in the air at different social events. In Nigeria, it's common to see rich people throw cash in the air as a sign of wealth and affluence. We don't exactly think it's the smartest thing to do, but then again, we've gone to the club before and wasted our money, so yeah. Anyways, we know that this is a video about dumb crimes, but we decided to start off with this strange and, dare we call it, dumb law. Anyway, Mr. Cubana, who calls himself a celebrity bartender and owns a popular nightclub in the oil-rich Delta state of Nigeria, which has 36 states, in case you didn't know, he's especially fond of this expensive act, which is called spraying in Nigeria, which is similar to making it rain in the US, but seems like it's done more at, like, weddings and other events like that. Apparently, it's a celebrity thing where money is typically stuck on people or thrown at them. The government doesn't like spraying and calls it an act of currency abuse and made it illegal. Since the act of spraying the banknotes doesn't damage them, but because they fall to the ground because of gravity and are stepped on by partygoers and dancers, it's apparently disrespectful to the banknotes. Enforcement of the currency law has been lax, and many people still believe that they can break the law without consequences. Maybe that's what Mr. Cubana thought, and now he's the latest Nigerian celebrity to be charged with the crime. After he was charged to court, Mr. Cubana was released on bail for 10 million naira, which is about $8,600. After his release, he took to Instagram to address his 5 million followers and thank them for their love and care. Interestingly, the police have since dropped the case and will no longer be moving ahead with prosecution. No one really knows why the case was dropped, or at least they act like they don't know why the case was dropped, but police had previously gotten a conviction for the same charge against another celebrity, popular Nigerian who goes by Babriski. He was sentenced to six months in jail without the option of a fine by a Nigerian high court. We're sure Mr. Cubana probably has his ways of making charges go away. Number five, not two cops. 
A mother and daughter duo were busted for transporting 62 pounds of the leafy greens through airport security in a pretty brazen attempt. Bridget Wilkins and her daughter, Victoria Wilkins, thought they could waltz through a Dallas airport crawling with law enforcement and sniffer canine dogs with 62 pounds of that special herb in their luggage. But they were sorely mistaken. Bridget had a bag that was emblazoned with a Los Angeles Police Department badge. Did she really think that the badge would allow her to walk through the airport without trouble? Or is this like a reverse reverse where she thought that police would think that no one would be that dumb to try this? Anyways, it's a moot point since canines at the airport can't read and identify badges as well as humans can, so the dogs just flagged her anyway and she was promptly searched. Once the police got into her luggage, they found 27 bundles of that ever so popular leafy greens and then found 36 more bundles in her daughter's bags. One interesting fact to note is that Bridget and Victoria most likely weren't caught because canines have extremely good noses and are extremely accurate as most people assume. Police dogs are actually not all that accurate as they do identify a lot of false positives. The reason it's hard to get past police dogs is because of the fact that they flag so many random things. The chances of the duo being flagged randomly, even without pounds of plants in their bags, was already high. In the end, the police confiscated the banned substance, their clothes, luggages, and cell phones, and charged the mother-daughter duo. Another interesting thing about this case is that this wasn't Bridget's first time getting in trouble. In 2009, she was arrested as part of a massive international fishing scheme that swindled people out of at least one and a half million dollars. She was handed a three-year suspended sentence for that crime. Number four, false advertising. Young mom, Jasmine Paez, used a fake website on the internet to try and get rid of her three-year-old son, and she's now been arrested. This mom presumably Googled for this specific service and came across some thankfully satirical website called rentahitman.com. The funny thing about this site is that it's so obviously fake and makes very absurd claims that you'd have to be really stupid to think it's real. For example, the site claims that the service is HIPAA compliant and that dark web hits are unsafe because of data breaches. But for some reason, 18-year-old Jasmine thought it was a real service and went through the trouble of filling a web form and speaking to a consultant about her plans to put out a hit on her three-year-old son. She also submitted the kid's picture and told the fake agent of the website the exact location the boy would be at. To make things worse, she agreed to pay $3,000 for the services. The site, which isn't a Honeypoint site, which is basically a decoy site used by the police, but just a run-of-the-mill satirical website, contacted the police after deeming Jasmine request too urgent to ignore. The owner of the site, Robert Inns, said that the fact that he could research the name of the intended target and see that they were an actual person living in the given area made him uneasy. This usually meant that the request was real and it wasn't just an equally satirical response. Inns said that the police didn't pay him a lot of attention at first and even threatened to issue a cease and desist letter if he continued to pester them. But he persisted anyway. When they finally took him seriously, they discovered that the threat was real. The police quickly swept in to arrest Jasmine after after tracking her IP to her address and confirming the identity of the toddler. Since the site in question is obviously satirical, it's hard to tell which way this case might go. It's very possible that Jasmine probably has some sort of mental issue. The website is seriously pretty funny, but a mother actually thinking is real and trying to take out her own baby is no joke. Hats off to Robert Inns, who most likely saved a life because who knows what Jasmine might have ended up doing if she wasn't stopped. Number three, jacking the Cybertruck. One of the dumbest things a thief can steal right now in the middle of 2024 is a cyber truck. But one dumb thief decided to do exactly that and stole the truck from a home in Delaware. Authorities aren't totally sure how he managed to even start the car, but they assume that it was possible because the owner was nearby with his card. Once the owner realized that his cyber truck was stolen, he called the police, who easily found the truck. It was super easy because, surprise, surprise, all Tesla vehicles come with a ton of security features that make them very easy to track. Who would have thought that the latest high-end electric vehicle would have a ton of security features, right? Imagine that. Anyway, the trucks have a built-in GPS that broadcasts their location to the owner through the Tesla app, and they can even be remotely disabled through the app as well. So when an officer arrived at the home the truck was stolen from, he was able to quickly locate the vehicle through the enabled GPS tracking in the Tesla app. The police found the vehicle on a dirt road less than a mile away from the house, and the suspect, who was still in the vehicle, 
vehicle, tried to get away. However, the pursuit was brief because the thief probably realized how impractical it would be to escape with the vehicle. So he turned the car off and quickly surrendered to the arresting officer. So he was dumb, but not like incredibly dumb. Good for him. The thing about stealing a Tesla Cybertruck in 2024 is that it's a car that sticks out. The car clearly has a very distinctive look, and this means that it attracts attention, and almost everyone will remember where they see one. And if you haven't seen one in person, they're a lot bigger than you'd expect. The truck is still somewhat a rare sight as of the release of this video, so there aren't exactly multiple Cybertrucks on the road at the same time everywhere like it is for the average car. Number two, orange getaway. A couple of thieves stole $1.8 million worth of products in a matter of seconds and then almost literally disappeared into thin air. The thieves wore hoods and masks on their faces when they burst into a store at a Miami Beach hotel and then swiped some pricey Hermes bags, throwing them into a garbage can they bought. The crazy thing about this robbery is that the thieves spent only about 43 seconds in the store and stole around 60 Birkin bags. Do we need to say Birkin bags are a extremely expensive, they start off at over 11 grand for a single bag and can even get into the hundreds of thousands of dollars in the secondary market. By the time they were done, they'd made away with about $1.8 million worth of fine leather goods. When the police arrived on the scene, they found the door to the boutique propped open with the lock hunched out, signaling that the thieves had broken in crudely. However, these thieves could run, but they couldn't hide. Just a few hours later, the police tracked one of the thieves down through the license plates of the inconspicuously bright orange Hyundai Santa Fe that brought both robbers to the store. The suspect that was apprehended was a man named Eduardo Traviso Garcia, who has since been arrested and charged. Maybe next time when he steals millions of dollars worth of luxury goods, he won't allow surveillance cameras to catch his plates and drive off in a truck that's painted in possibly one of the most eye-catching colors available. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out some of the dumbest ways people blow money. Number one, no separation. Heather McCarthy, a disgraced staff recruitment officer, claimed that she had a baby in order to avoid going to jail at her sentencing hearing. Heather only brought up this baby on the day she was supposed to be sentenced and claimed that no one knew about her child because she suffered from postnatal depression. Since judges only separate kids from their mothers as a last resort, Heather thought this lie would get her out of jail and would only earn a probation sentence. And she was correct. Once the judge heard that she had a child, he decided to give her a suspended sentence sentence to avoid separating her from her child. But the thing about such huge lies is that it's near impossible to keep them going. After her court appearance, people who knew her started to raise suspicions about the existence of this supposed kid, so she was called back to court in order to provide a birth certificate. But Heather told the court that she would produce the certificate, but she couldn't right then because it was in storage. Eventually, she just broke down and confessed that she made the whole thing up in a panic. Of course, this earned her another court date, and this time, she couldn't get out of actual prison time through lying. Her original eight-month sentence was promptly activated. So what did Heather do to even end up in jail in the first place? Well, she was working as a recruitment officer for a firm, and her job was to hire employees and ensure their papers and timestamps were in order. Not long after she was hired, her employers set a meeting to discuss her falling standards. Apparently, Heather wasn't very good at her job. But of course, she didn't go to that meeting and instead chose to resign. Sensing something was shady, her employers launched an investigation into her work records and discovered that she'd stolen over 7,700 pounds from them. She stole this money by filling timestamps for salaries that went straight into her account, and she did it about 20 times. After her arrest, Heather claimed she committed the crime because a former partner knew about her criminal history and was ready to share it with the class. Apparently, she had gotten in trouble for doing the exact same thing, embezzling with another company, and got a suspended sentence for it. Obviously, she didn't disclose this critical and apparently consequential fact to her more recent employers. So in court, Heather explained that she gave the ex part of the stolen money and then spent the rest on drinks and catering to her own nose beer problem. She said she ultimately resigned from the company because she wanted to keep her resume unblemished and that that was why her more recent employers didn't know about her previously suspended sentence. It's so stupid to just make up a fake kid to get away with a crime, right? Just a quick check would prove that she didn't have a kid. Click to watch one of these next videos.